Uh, so, so my name is uh, Guillaume Bourg. So as I mentioned uh, this morning a little bit, uh, I work at uh, McGill, the Genome Centre, and I also lead uh, the Canadian Centre for Computational Genomics, uh, that basically is a platform to do bioinformatics analysis as a service um, as part of Genome Canada. Um, so again, uh, as, as mentioned by uh, Anne this morning, so it's, this is a new workshop. You know, we set it up with, with Mike really starting with a, sort of a basic introduction about the types of things that, uh, you know, where variant calling in particular can be useful. Um, Mathieu and, and my module are a bit more technical, sort of going through the steps of, of really variant calling and variant annotation. And, and you'll see that at the end of, of the module uh, three, uh, Mike will actually come back and, and sort of then once you've generated these variants, he'll go back uh, and link back to his introduction on how you can actually then uh, really use that to interpret disease and, and phenotypes. So uh, again, hopefully uh, that, that whole uh, overall flow will, will make sense. Um, so my module really follows on, on uh, Mathieu's module. So Mathieu was talking about variant calling and mapping, and I'll, I'll be talking about uh, variant annotation. Um, so going back to, to the um, sort of the overview of what um, uh, the data processing for calling variant looks like. Uh, so again, Matthew co uh, covered the initial step with the data processing. Now we're going to uh, be going over in module three the variant discovery and, and variant annotation. Variant annotation. So the specific objectives um, of, of this module is to I guess that's the team for, for today, identification of disease-causing mutation. Um, understanding, so, so I've included some slides. Uh, we haven't talked about this yet, but what are the limits and the challenges with this? And, and, and you know, should you be doing exome and whole genome? So I'll be covering that. Uh, and then I'll go into the more technical part of um, the VCF and really these files with the variants and how do you actually filter and prioritize the variants that you get. Um, so, uh, you know, for, first of all, what, what's the overall objective here is to identify disease-causing mutation. And, and Mike touched on that a little bit, but so the terminology is, is I think, important here. Um, so you've got, um, you know, pathogenic mutation, which is what we're, we're trying to identify uh, that contribute mechanistically to the disease. Um, and, and again, Mike touched on that. It's not necessarily fully penetrant, but it, um, you know, but that's so that, that's the, you know, the objective is to identify these. Um, you can have variants that are going to be implicated in the disease. Uh, so that's when there's evidence that's consistent with them having a pathogenic uh, role um, with a certain level of confidence. Uh, we've talked about associated uh, variants that are significantly enriched, but there's really this whole um, range. Um, damaging mutations that would alter uh, normal levels of a gene, and then finally deleterious. So you really have uh, these different um, sort of uh, types of, of, of mutations that you might be looking for. Um, so, so how do you actually um, identify variants that are uh, implicated in, in human disease. So this paper that, that I have the, you know, the reference at the bottom, I think it's quite interesting in, in providing, this is just a subset of some of the, of the recommendations, I guess, to, to, you know, really associate variants to the, uh, the disease. So there's some general guidelines, um, really sort of, uh, you know, you have to, you know, an observation, you'll have to actually compute the, the probability of observing that by chance. Uh, this is related, in, you know, in part to, to uh, like the GWAS. If you're doing multiple hypothesis tests, you have to, you know, really calculate the probability of observing that by chance. Um, a, 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 an important guideline, and, and, and that will be um, sort of, I'll, I'll go back to that, but taking advantage of public data sets uh, is obviously very important. So knowing whether it's a, it's a rare variant or something that's common in the population will, is a, you know, a very important aspect uh, in, in implicating variants in human disease. Um, so, so, so a number of guidelines, again, I highlighted a few of the key ones, I thought. So 
Um, so how, what's the evidence uh, for that gene to really be implicated? Uh, is this a new report? Uh, but only do that when you can actually see, and, and again, Mike had a slide on that, you see the same variant in multiple individual, uh, comparing the distribution between hopefully a matched control cohort. Um, so r reporting what's, what's the evidence for that variant to be, uh, to be pathogenic, um, so recognizing that strong evidence that a variant is deleterious is not necessarily enough to, to implicate as a causal role. Uh, ideally, you won't also want to be able to have sort of orthogonal um, experimental validation that actually confirms that that variant has an actual damaging impact. Um, so, and then finally, it's important to, to highlight the actionable findings, uh, but you also want to be reporting uh, the additional findings uh, at the same time. So again, so this is just a, sort of a, a snapshot, but I really uh, recommend uh, looking at that uh, particular paper that provides guidelines uh, as, a, as an example. Um, so, so moving on to, to, to the next topic here, which is to identify and understand some of the limit and the challenges when you're trying to do this variant calling and annotation. So, um, so Here's another, uh, I think, uh, recent and, and great review. And so I, I highlighted uh, uh, some, some key components. So there's a big difference between, you know, so we talked about that a little bit in terms of applying these technologies in the research context versus applying them in, in a clinical context. Uh, so there's, uh, you know, there's great potential to apply these uh, technologies in, you know, really for diagnosis and, and in the clinic. Um, but, but, you know, it's, there's, there needs to be some, uh, some adjustments uh, in, in how these tools are applied once it's done in a clinical setting. And uh, Carl, in the module at the end of the day, uh, will we'll go back to that point in terms of uh, some, some regulations and, and, and things like that. But there's also sort of more, um, well, so, some basic principles where when you're, so, so the, the quote that I'm highlighting here, I think is, is, is quite interesting. So, you know, most of the algorithms that we're gonna be using here were, were developed for discovery. So, uh, you know, if you're missing a variant in, in uh, exome sequencing, um, you know, at some level you're missing an opportunity for a discovery. Uh, and that's, you know, it's unfortunate, but it's not necessarily the end of the world. But once you're applying these methods in a clinical setting, making an, an inaccurate diagnosis because you're not picking up a variant uh, is, is, is a whole other ballgame. Um, so, so related to that, um, it's quite interesting to think about. So once we start talking about applying these sequencing technologies in the clinic, you know, one of the first questions, I guess, both in the research and in the clinical setting is, is whether to do exome or whole genome sequencing to detect these variants. And, and in this review, I think they do a, a great job of sort of showing and highlighting some of the differences and, and the implication of those differences. Uh, so here at the top, you have um, in, in the example uh, in a coding region, so this, is, this, is, this would be, for instance, an exome, of the coverage you get from whole genome sequencing, fr from a standard exome capture sequencing, and from a sort of an augmented or targeted special uh, exome capture kits. Uh, so some of the newer generation of capture. Um, so you see that, um, you know, well, first of all, you've got irregular coverage, even from whole genome sequencing. Some parts are not necessarily covered as much as others. In some case, with, with uh, some uh, exome capture technology, you might have even bigger gaps. Um, so this is, this is in the coding region. Once you move to, to sort of a genomic region that includes coding and non-coding, uh, you see again that, that whole genome coverage is, is not completely uniform, such that you still have some regions that are, have relatively co low coverage. At least you're, you're covering most of the genome, uh, but the coverage is not uniform. And again, that contrasts quite a bit with the exome, which, as you can see here, as expected, sort of covers very specific regions of the genome that are coding. Uh, so what does that translate to? And especially in the clinical context, um, so 
so this is quite, so maybe we start with, um, we're looking over here. So these are the 56 uh, most actionable gene uh, as from the American College of Medical Genetics, uh, you know, uh, guidelines. So these 56 genes are the ones that systematically should be, uh, so if, if variants are detected in these genes, they should be reported. And, and what these this plots are showing is that, um, you know, some of the bases, coding bases of these genes are not necessarily uh, very well covered. Uh, well, if you take, you look, for instance, at this exome array, uh, so they did this experiment to see, you know, what, per, what the number of bases that are not covered uh, for these 56 genes uh, at a certain, you know, coverage level and a certain quality. So you see that there's quite a lot of variability. So this shows that even, you know, there are blind spots basically in these very important genes uh, that, that you won't be able to call any variants in those um, using that particular platform. That's also true if you're using whole genome sequencing, if, although this is a little bit better. Uh, and in some ways, it might be that, that these more targeted uh, exome, in this case, have uh, a slightly better coverage. But again, it's, I think it's, it's useful to, 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 to be aware that, you know, the choice of technology and whole genome sequencing is not necessarily um, it's great for discovery, but it might, you know, not be uh, the most appropriate thing, depending on, on the types of questions that you're asking. Um, so this is, I think, something important to, to keep in mind as you're, uh, as you're choosing which platform to use and, and really thinking about the, the types of questions that you're going to have. Uh, so this is in terms of the actual coverage. So there's lots of, of other challenges that are associated with with uh, using these next generation sequencing technologies for, for variant calling. Um, so, so Mathieu again touched on that uh, a bit, but there's, um, so there's, again, blind spots because these reads are, are short reads, so that has an impact in terms of, um, you know, whether you're able to, to map them uniquely on the genome. Um, so you've got regions where you're mapping to the reference genome. So one, this is one that's, I think, um, quite interesting. Um, the, the reference itself that we're using to map the reads is a genome, right? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's not quite the genome of one individual, but it still contains variants that are actually rare, and in some cases might actually be, um, you know, disease variants. So if the, the reference genome contains a disease variant, um, you're going to not be calling that the variant in your data set because it's going to, you know, your data is going to look uh, just like the reference at that location. So you might be missing some variants that were already also present in the, in the reference genome. Um, long repeats and, and highly polymorphic regions, this is when the short reads are not great at, at mapping into these regions um, and, and where you also are going to have uh, and make some mistakes. Uh, there's some more, I'll, I'll get back to this one. In, in more detail, but this is about the fact that variant calling for single nucleotide uh, variants is is increasing. You know, it's pretty accurate, and, and we have good good pipelines and good algorithms to do that. But as you go towards other types of structural variant, um, that can be sometimes more challenging. Um, there's additional challenges that are at some level um, a bit more technical, but the way the, the variants are encoded in the VCF files, and we'll get back to that, sometimes there's some ambiguity in terms of, of the variants that you're reporting, and you might, it might lead to, to mistake as well. Uh, but the key thing I, I wanted to, to, to expand on here is, is these uh, structural variants here and, and other types of variants. So in the context of the of the, the module that we're going to do and the, the practical that we're going to do, we're really going to be focusing on detecting these point mutations, but uh, especially with whole genome sequence data, um, you, you really have, in theory, the ability to detect a whole range of, of uh, variants. So whether it's, it's short indels, uh, copy number alterations with, with deletions uh, or duplications, um, and then um, translocation, foreign DNA, and so on. So there's a range of, 
uh, of variants uh, that you can detect. Um, so as I said, the, the focus of, uh, of the pipelines that we'll present today are really around the single nucleotide variants, which tend to be the ones that, you know, where the benchmarking has been done and, and we have a good confidence in the calls that are made out of the data. Uh, but as you go towards um, some of these other types of uh, structural variants that, uh, or regions in, in low complexity, for instance, uh, there's clearly a, a lower accuracy of, of uh, calling these variants once you're in, in those types of events. So um, I was just discussing, I guess, over lunch about, you know, what happens if you've done this single nucleotide variant calling. In some cases, you know, you won't find any very good hit, and it might be that it's uh, is through some of these other types of events that, uh, um, you know, that actually is associated with the disease. Uh, so, you know, I think it makes sense to start with the uh, single nucleotide variants because that is, um, you know, where there's, you know, you know, again, we have good accuracy and we are able to call those, uh, but it might also be worth then applying some of these other tools to the data to pick up these other variants as well. Um, so related to that, uh, another challenge, and now we're finding you're sort of getting closer to the variant annotation. Uh, so this is a project that um, that I was part of, that, that where we did the sequencing uh, at the Genome Center, and so we sequence. So this is uh, so some of you are, are working on, in cancer, uh, so so you might be already aware of this. But so this is sequencing uh, 100 kidney tumors. And what I'm showing you here are, uh, so every square represents a thousand mutation that we found. So you see that in total, we found more than half a million uh, mutations from this data. So uh, the challenge to, to identify, you know, within that giant list of mutation, which ones maybe are associated with the disease uh, can be quite, quite daunting. And so this is from whole genome sequence data. Uh, the obvious thing, of course, is to, to focus on the coding mutations. Uh, so that's a very small subset of all the mutations that we detect. Um, most of, of, so again, so it's funny because you, you, you do the whole genome sequencing and then in the end, most of what you use is really a very small subset of the mutations that you detect. Those are the ones uh, that we know a little bit how to, to annotate, how to predict the potential impact, but it's, you know, there's a, so, and that's what we'll do as well today, uh, but, but there's potentially some damaging mutation in the non-coding regions of the genome as well, um, and that's some of the things that we'll talk about tomorrow. So that's, but that's, I guess, another uh, sort of ongoing area of research is how to actually annotate and prioritize and filter uh, not just the coding mutation, but also the non-coding mutations that we detect. Um, Okay, so that was my um, sort of my introduction in terms of of, um, of what our objective is, what we want to do, and, and then some of the challenges. But uh, now we're going to sort of continue on, on what Mathieu started to present and continue with the uh, the workflow of uh, annotating uh, variants. Uh, so again, the you know the overview of the workflow is that. You do some, some data processing. Um, you want to be mapping, and that's what we're going to do, assuming that the cluster is working. How do you actually map the data, call the variants, and then annotate, um, annotate the variants? So before I talk about the, the variant annotation, I, I wanted to add a little bit to um, some of the things that Mathieu talked about uh, before lunch. So, um, so Mathieu talked, so just on the variant calling, uh, still. So Mathieu talked about, so you map the, the reads, and then there's a number of things that you can do to actually improve the variant calling. Uh, you can do local realignment to improve the variant calling. You remove the duplicates. Uh, you can correct the quality scores. Uh, another, another interesting thing to improve variant calling is to actually use a family and population or population structure to actually improve the calling. So this especially is important if you don't have extremely high coverage. Uh, instead of calling the variants separately in the samples, you might actually want to call variants using the information that you have on the pedigree or on the population. Uh, 
Um, so here's, here's um, sort of a, an overview of this. Um, so again, on the right side, you have the basic, uh, you know, base calling, remapping, realignment, and so on. And then you do single sample. One at a time, you call the variants. Uh, and that's going to produce a list of variants. Uh, but, but you can actually, um, and depending on, on whether you have a cohort or you have, again, families, you can also call uh, the variants with, with that information in mind, do multiple sample calling. Uh, that actually has the potential in some case, and I, I didn't put the, the slides that show that, but in certain cases, especially if you have low sequencing, as I said, um, it might actually help you improve the quality of the calls quite a bit. Uh, and just to give you uh, sort of a, I guess I do have it in, in the slides coming up, but to, to give you an idea of how that works, um, so suppose that you have two haplotypes in your population. So in the population, you know, there's a limited number of, of haplotypes in a given region that are, uh, that are in that population. Uh, so if you have information about this, uh, that there's really, you know, a haplotype blue and a haplotype red. Uh, so if after that you observe reads from an individual um, that have this, uh, you know, these letters, uh, you can probably guess what the N is without re really looking at it, right? So, so again, you can use information about haplotypes in the population, about other sample to sort of correct or, or, or do a better job at if you see an error in a read, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to detect it more easily. So again, I, go, I don't go into the detail, but that was just to give you an idea of, of the fact that in the context of variant calling, sometimes it's useful to, to either use information from the population or use other sample. Um, and this is, I wasn't sure if I had that plot, but this shows um, from, from the initial papers on, from, from GATK, uh, how much uh, this can help improve the genotype accuracy, especially for um, in, in this low range here um, of, of you know rare mutations. So, uh, but again, that's that, that was just sort of a, a, an aside. Uh, yeah. I've seen that one of the ways that you improve the accuracy is by getting rid of duplicates. Yes. But duplicate reads don't really change the. Call. It, it would throw off your VAF or That's stuff right. like that. That's right. But it's just to get cleaner data or well so so the problem so suppose you have an error and then that error is duplicated, oh. right? So if it says so you, you're gonna think that you saw it five times and then in you know you're gonna weight it too strongly. But if these are all exactly the same read, that's where it, it makes a difference. So So how do you tell the difference between a duplicate and actually two independent So it's it's usually based on the fact that it's exactly the same start and end. So if they have exactly the same sequence, those reads get, get pulled out. Uh, they get marked as duplicate, and then they just get counted once okay. in this calculation of whether, you know, because you're, you're weighting the observation, right? So it, it just gets a, a weight of one in this case. And then typically, if you have relatively high coverage, you won't trust these, you know, single read that are saying that there's a change here. Um, so... So again, so putting, and this relates well to the, uh, to, to the presentation by Mike, but taking information about uh, the pedigree and, and calling and then looking at the segregation of these uh, variants actually helps you quite a bit uh, identify the good candidates. Uh, if you see, you know, if there's a very strong uh, phenotype in the kid and, and that variant is found in, in, uh, in the parent, uh, you know, it's unlikely that that's really the, the cause of the disease. Okay, so this was sort of my uh, add-on to, to the module two on, on variant calling. Um, so in terms of, of what types of files and what's the size of the files that you're dealing with, so you're starting, uh, well, in the practical, Mathieu was kind enough not to start with the full uh, file, uh, sequence file, which would have been very big. Uh, but And then you apply, and that's what we'll do in the practical, you apply, um, you apply tool to actually call the variants. Um, we're going to be using GATK. There's alternative ways you can also call the variants. So you go from a very big file that contains all of these map reads 
to something that's much more manageable, manageable sorry, which is the, the VCF files, which actually has the call. These are, these are per patient? Yes, yes. So, yeah, so one patient, this is whole genome sequencing again, but that, that would be the size per patient. So if you have a big cohort of patient, this adds up to quite a bit. So that's why, um, you know, learning how to use uh, clusters like Compute Canada is useful. By the time you get to the VCF, uh, these are files that you can more easily load onto these, you know, web services, a bit like what you'll do with Mike uh, at the end here. Um, so what do these uh, variant files look like? Uh, so again, Matsu talked about the FASTQs and the BAM. If you look at what the VCF files look like, um, so this, this stands for variant call format, so it's very, <laughs> makes a lot of sense. So you've got uh, a, a lot of, so header lines which provide information on what, you know, what was run, what reference files were used, and, and various parameters of the, of the uh, variant caller that you use. So this is header information. And then the, the key information is embedded in, in all of these rows. Um, so each row corresponding at this point to, to a variant. Uh, so you've got the chromosome position, um, you know, the ID of the, so the, the reference base, so what is usually seen in the reference genome at that position, what's actually observed. Uh, a quality score associated no longer with the read, but with the, the call itself. So that, you know, we were just talking about the number of reads that support that variant and so on. So all of that gets converted into a quality score associated with uh, the variant call. Uh, and then additional, uh, additional info fields uh, that contain information about the reads that were supporting, uh, oops, that, that were supporting uh, the call. Um, so again, so we'll, we'll go over that, and you'll go over that with, uh, in the practical with, with Mathieu some more. Uh, so that's the basic uh, file, and again, this is at least more manageable in size. These are all the positions that are different in your genome relative to the reference genome. Um, so, but as I said, so you'll have, you potentially have in a given project, you know, a very big file number, lots of number of variants uh, from this. So, so the next step is really to sort of filter and, and annotate these, uh, this, this uh, file with the variant. Um, so how do you filter the variant? So, uh, so, so you can do some, some manual filtering based on, you know, how many reads and what's the score and things like that. Uh, but if you haven't done this before, it's a bit challenging to know exactly, you know, where, where do you draw the line? So do you take, so in here, if you have quality score of three, you know, is this a variant that you should uh, pay attention to, right? So how do you know uh, which scores and which, which variant to filter? Um, so so there's, there's nice tool that actually, um, actually using data, and, and I'll show you how that works, uh, that actually use the data itself and known calls to, to do a better rank order of this uh, based on the likelihood of being real. Um, so, so we won't be uh, doing that uh, today, this part, uh, but just so that you know that that, uh, that can be done. So, so what you do is you actually take uh, data that's um, that's a good proxy either for false negatives. So you, so you want to know. Um, <clears throat> so so there's high quality data uh, like the HapMap project uh, that actually reports known variants in the population from uh, the HapMap project. Uh, so you can use that to see whether you're actually uh, missing some some variants in your call, and you don't want to be uh, missing out too many of what are known to be, you know, reasonable variants. Um, so, and then you can use other data set like, well, it's a bit scary to be using dbSNP in this context, but it's known that in particular in, you know, there's a lot of variants that are mistake as part of dbSNP that were included. So you can include that as a set of potentially false positive. And, and again, in the GATK package, what they've done and they've shown is that you can use these set of good calls and, and not so good calls to actually train the parameters and, and better rank uh, 
that are ranked a variance. Uh, so this is sort of, again, you know, not going into the details of how that worked, but you can use that feature to actually recalibrate uh, the variance score uh, using, you know, good quality, you know, known variance and, and known false positive. You use that to recalibrate the score of the variant calling algorithm. So this is one of the one of the features that actually is also included in the in the framework that's being used for calling variants. Um, so I'm coming uh, towards the end now um, of, of what I wanted to present before we, we get into the practical of actually doing all of that. Uh, so now the, the variant annotation and prioritization. So, so far all we've done is map the reads, call the variants, uh, sort of clean them up and, and filter what look, you know, sort of rank them in terms of uh, how likely they're, they're good based on, on various properties of number of reads and so on. But now the other key step is really to annotate and prioritize them. Um, so, well, so I've, I've touched on some of these annotations already. So quality and confidence score is obviously a criteria that you want to be looking at when you're looking at these variants. So what was the quality of the call? Uh, if there are reads that are uh, in low confidence regions, you want to annotate that. So this is uh, annotations about the quality and the confidence. Uh, another important thing, and, and again, I've talked about that a little bit, but um, so you want to be able to, to, to report whether a particular variant is found in dbSNP, has been observed before, because you know if it's in 20% of the population, it's unlikely that this is uh, the rare, you know, de novo mutation that you're looking for. So, so having, and I'll, I'll get back over some of these um, uh, database of a previously observed variants, but previously, you know, the annotation of whether this has been observed before is quite uh, critical. Um, so you have then, this is in population mainly, uh, then you've got specific disease databases that you might be able to use to know whether particular variant has been associated or observed in a uh, clinical setting. So this is ClinVar. Again, I'll, I'll go over these uh, databases a little bit. Uh, I should say that these lists are not comprehensive, but this gives you example of some of the important annotation you want to be adding to your, your variants. And then the last category of annotation is, is these variant effect predictor. And, and Mike touched on that this morning, um, especially for, for coding mutations. Uh, there's lots and lots of tools. Oops. There's lots of tools um, that can predict uh, the impact uh, of the variant on on the gene. So whether it's likely damaging, and all of these are, are for the most part just putative effects. But it's still quite quite you know if it's a inserts a stop codon versus a splice change versus a synonymous change and so on. Uh, you also, as I said for you know the majority if you're doing whole genome sequencing the majority will be uh, non-coding variants uh, the annotation there of the effect is is more uh, is, is less well defined uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that part a little bit more uh, tomorrow um, so going uh, going back here so I you know I've talked hopefully at some level, about these confidence scores. Uh, I'll talk now a little bit more about these uh, databases that can be used. Um, so in the, in the um, so separate from 1000 Genome and, and uh, dbSNP, uh, one resource that has been, that was initiated as the exact um, uh, database and has now become the Genome Aggregation Database, so or NOMAD, uh, so this is this is a great tool where basically a great database where people that are you know sequencing as part of various projects are submitting uh, their VCF uh, from exome and whole genome to be aggregated into this database. So um, again, you know it's a it's a great way. So it's, so as of as of right now, it contains data or the variant calls from over 100,000 exome over 15,000 genome. So this is a great resource because, again, if you're, uh, if you're sequencing a new patient and you want to know whether that, that you know, has been observed before as a way of prioritizing, uh, this is a very useful resource because you're able to say, 
you know, if it's, you know, you, sh you choose your own threshold of what, what you're comfortable with, and you, maybe you don't set it to zero, but, but if you expect something that shouldn't be found too frequently because it's specific to that disease or that patient, you might uh, set some filters on frequency in, these, uh, in this database. So again, this is sort of really uh, at large, uh, any exome and whole genome sequence uh, data. Um, and then, um, but so here, the only information you get is on the frequency of that variant in this uh, particular database. Uh, yeah. These are people with benign disease. That's right. So, yeah. uh, or or in, in many cases, just population, right? So. Right. So, yeah, so that's a good question. So, um, I mean, again here, so if it's a different platform, you might not have a call in that database because it didn't cover that particular region. So um, you, you can't really use it for, for uh, being sure that it's not there, right? So, but, but if you, again, if it's been observed in that database, at least you know that it's been there. But it's not fully homogeneous. So it's different platform and different uh, different variant calling in some ways, right? So it's not a fully homogeneous data set, but at least if you if it has been observed before, you, you know you know that. But you can't use it to say it's never you know it's not been observed. So it's, it's, it's a lot like so, so this is to give you confidence that that variant is real. Typically here, we're using it to say it's not been observed before. So if you're looking for something that's not been observed before, um, you know, that's, that's a useful resource. Um, that's typically the way these, these databases are used in this case. We do a lot in, in cancer genomics just to think if it's a benign polymorphism, especially if it's at greater than one. That's right. That's right. So it also has sort of that's that right. utility. That's right. But, but again, if it's if it's found in, in ten percent, uh, yeah, it's unlikely to be uh, to be very uh, damaging. Um, okay, so these are are really database for providing frequency information of variants. Uh, then you have more targeted uh, databases that are collecting information about variants that have been associated with uh, with disease and with supporting information. So. Uh, this would be used sort of in the reverse way where you actually want to find, um, you know, something that's not too common in the population and then has been previously associated with a disease in a different context, you would probably want to increase, um, um, you know, that, that pushes up that variant in, in your list probably because it's already been associated with a disease. Uh, so this is true. At the level of, of sometimes so variant specific variants, so this would be ClinVar, um, and and in cancer you have other databases uh, more like Cosmic. At some level, there's also now a database through ICGC that really has also a frequency of different uh, variants as opposed uh, as as observed in different uh, types of cancer. Um, so, but overall these, you know. This type of annotation of a frequency in population and of, uh, you know, previously been observed and been associated with disease is obviously these are all fields that you want to fill in um, and, and add to your, your variant list. Um, so the last, uh, well, so the, the last category that I had after the database, if you remember, were these effect predictions. So another type of annotation that you want to to add to, to your variance is predicted effects. So you, you know, separate from presence or absence in various databases, uh, can you predict what that variant is doing to that gene? Um, so here, so uh, Mike talked a bit about Polyfen 2. I mean, there's a total of 87 different tools as reported on this uh, particular website that do this. So there's lots and lots of different uh, ways you can do that, and, and you know. People have different uh, different opinion about what works, you know, better or worse. I don't think there's a single uh, 
uh, tool to do that annotation that's necessarily better than the others. It's good to sometimes have, and if you can, sort of have annotation from a few of these uh, in parallel to, to predict the impact uh, of the variance. Um, so now, a bit of a challenge is, so I've already mentioned the fact that, you know, you want to be annotating your variant with databases, you want to predict their impact, so you have to run all of these different tools separately, so thankfully not, because uh, there's a number of tools, including the one that you're going to be using in, 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 the, in the practical, that actually aggregate different types of annotation. And so you only have to run one tool uh, to do this annotation, and itself it will go to the various appropriate database and will actually predict impact using also sort of a collection or an ensemble of uh, effect prediction algorithms. So um, again, there's, there's quite a number of, of, of tools that do this in different ways. Uh, you know, and they, in some cases they will, they claim to, to, to prioritize the, the, the variance even better. Um, you know, it's, I, I, I wouldn't say that there's just one way of doing this. Again, it's, it's at some level it's convenience that to be able to run one tool that's going to aggregate, uh, pre, you know, annotation and effect prediction from, from a number of tools will, will be good. Um, so, so again, so you, we'll, we'll try one of them that actually aggregates, as you'll see, uh, a few different types of annotation. Uh, oh, what did you? Um, finally, so, so it's again from the same uh, resource, uh, they were pointing to, to a few tools, not just to annotate, but now to prioritize. Uh, in the context of, of cancer, uh, in particular, there's a number of tools that are interesting that actually will prioritize genes based on the tip, you know, a number of mutations that they're getting and so on, relative to what you would expect by chance. So again, there's uh, here again, whether it's uh, based on the number of mutations per gene relative to what's expected, or whether you have, you know, an enrichment for mutation in specific pathways. Um, so you have, again, sort of a number of tools uh, that, that can do that uh, for, for different purposes. Um, so the, the, the tool and the, the, the approach that, that we'll be using uh, in the practical uh, is a tool that was developed by uh, Pablo Singolani uh, that used to work uh, at the Genome Center, uh, but is a tool that's really uh, well integrated with, with uh, GATK and is used uh, quite heavily. Um, so you know, so using SNPF, you can annotate using reference genome. You can calculate the effects of whether it's a, you know, if it's a coding a mutation, whether it has a, you know, what type of effect it has, and then it has a uh, basic prioritization into, you know, potentially high or moderate or low impact on the, on the gene where it's detected. So this is, again, uh, we'll go over that with, uh, in the practical and in more detail. Um, so just to continue with this overview and this workflow, so we started with the very big files with the alignments. We now have, you know, you'll generate a raw VCF file uh, that basically just has good quality calls with, with quality scores. And so what you want to do after that is, is annotate this file uh, and get a filtered and annotated list of variants, still in the VCF format, but now having including a lot more information in the, in the various uh, other columns and in the, in the various fields. Um, so just uh, so two, two little things before, before I end. Um, one of the tools that we, we won't be using in the practical, but that we um, use uh, to actually navigate these VCF, especially once uh, you've generated this, uh, this annotated VCF for one patient, you might actually have multiple VCF with this annotation. And um, so one, one strategy is to load these various VCF into uh, a tool. So, so for instance, Gemini, and that actually allows you to, to navigate through this VCF and ask specific question uh, to sort of sort, you know, uh, 
uh, variants that are found, you know, that, that match the, the expectation in the, based on the information you have on the pedigree and, and so on. So, so this is not something that, that we'll do, but it's another tool that I recommend once you actually have generated the VCF, if, especially if you have multiple patients or, or, or pedigree or family information, uh, and you want to, to sort of filter your, your, your VCF using additional criteria, um, that's, you know, maybe a tool also to, to explore and look at. Um, so a final note before I, I, uh, we move on to the practical, go backwards to the practical, um, is one thing that we, we won't have time to cover, uh, but that's extremely important is uh, visualization of these uh, data sets. So, um, so I, didn't, I didn't say what, what this tool was. So this is the uh, integrative genome viewer, IGV uh, browser, which is a, a tool that allows you uh, to load both your BAMs and your VCFs um, such that you can, you can really, because at some level you're generating all of these files, but you don't have a way of checking um, you know, what, what actually is coming out. So it's very important and useful and necessary to, because you might have a mistake in your pipeline somewhere, uh, it's very useful uh, to, to loan your, the raw data, uh, the raw BAM in this case, not the raw FASTQ, but the BAM once the reads are aligned, this is what you see here in gray. Uh, these are all the reads uh, that have been mapped to the genome. We're looking at a particular region and, you know, all the matches are, are shown in gray, and then you've got the, the mismatch that actually are, well, there's different views, but in this particular view, when there's a mismatch, uh, you, you actually see the, um, you see the, the letter that's at this specific position. So from this, it, it's quite clear that you've got some errors in your read, that, you know, at the rate that's expected, while uh, the variant that we're looking at, is, it really stands out as being very clear. But you know, once you get to the stage of having your VCF and having your, your variant that you think uh, is, is uh, most interesting, it's very good and, and, and necessary to go back uh, to look at, at the evidence, basically, that we're in the reads for that variant. Because by looking at it, you might see that maybe there was a mistake uh, in, in, in one of the processing steps or that the the region is, is messier than you would expect it, but it's just it's quite useful and, and, and important to, to look at that. So um, that's the end of this module. Um, so happy to take some some questions, uh, and if not, after that we'll do we'll go back and actually finish all these steps from uh, the beginning. Uh, going back to this point of the fact that there are regions of the genome that are not covered. If you have a, a gene that you suspect or you were looking for a mutation potentially in that gene and nothing comes up in the VCF, it's also good, again, to go and visualize that data. There might not be coverage on parts of that gene or part of that exon. That might explain why you're not seeing anything. So it's really, even though we're not covering that in this workshop because we didn't have enough time, uh, there's other workshops that you could attend that uh, cover the visualization, but it's, it's really quite important to, to, to do that. I'm sorry? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes. So the, the basis for this not uniformly coverage is basically because some regions are not mappable. So it's a combination of regions that are not mappable. So if they're you know pseudogenes or duplicated regions, you might have ambiguity in terms of where the reads come from. There's also like a depletion of GC rich regions in the sequencing. So just for, for technical reason, those regions don't get sequenced nearly as much. And so in, in the whole exome capture data, a lot of time, or even in the whole genome for that matter, the first exon, which tends to be GC rich, is frequently less covered. So if, and if you don't have enough coverage, uh, you end up having uh, no calls. So, it's, uh, so that's another thing. Let's say, so assume that you have a, a trio you know, and you see a, a mutation in, in, the, in the kid that you think is a de novo mutation because it's not called in the two parents, it's probably good to go check to see if there's any reads that still supported that in the parents because it might be under the cutoff of being a call as a, you know, high quality variant in the parent, but it might still have been there. So if you didn't do this, you know, three-way calling, you might have missed it in the parent and might still be there. So it's good to go and actually check whether there's coverage 
on what you think is a de novo mutation. So do you think that long read sequencing yeah, so long read sequencing will overcome the issue of, of maybe having a more uniform coverage and definitely going into these, um, you know, going into these harder types of repeats where, you know, so if you have, again, mobile insertions of L1 that are too long for the short reads, you can't detect them. But with the long reads, you will be. The problem with the long reads is that it's still quite expensive for doing a deep enough human coverage so but at some point that that you know that will be uh, useful With longer reads you also get a higher error rate as well that's so right sort of a yin -yang is yes you're introducing a different type of error but the error rate i think is 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 coming along and and again as soon as you have multiple of these long reads you can correct the errors quite quite easily i think the cost is is a bigger uh challenge with uh like Right now, whole genome with Illumina is in the range of, you know, $1,500 or something like that, while whole genome with Pike Bio is 20000 or something. So it's, uh, there's the, the other approach is the things like the 10x, where you have information about long fragments and then still do the short read. So that's, that's but, but these are, I think, still in, in sort of research and exploration mode. Is that, is that to calculate the, the ideal read length that is not expensive as a long read, but <laughs> it's not as problematic as short read. That's 150 is too short, but uh, I don't need a 10K read. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, to be fair, with, with 150, especially paired in, there's not much of the genome that's, that's not mappable, right? Okay. So it's, uh, you know, but... But a lot, you know. But you know, even if you're missing five percent of the genome, you know, there's still the chance that it's that's where the mutation that you're interested in. So how do you how do you weigh that in? Yeah. It's, it's hard. I mean, so I mean, I went back and forth. But again, going back to this, you know, it's, how do you determine what's enough, right? So you're missing out just you know 500 nucleotide in these genes. Is that a problem or not? It's uh, and one thing this doesn't show is whether or not the bases which are missed on subsequent assays are the same bases, just quantitatively. Like you're missing 100 bases, it's uh, not the same bases. So I think this is the average of, of right. multiple samples. So this is, it's, it's pretty systematic what you're missing. So okay. it's going to be because of repeats, because of lack of capture. So, so the, the exome, so it's, it's, it's consistent. Okay. And well, to be, it's consistent within technology. Right? So it's not going to be consistent. So that's one of the challenge if you're using these control cohorts and you have a new assay that's looking into regions or such that it's not covered in the other one, you know, going back to your question in the back, that's going to be an issue. So it's, but it's definitely consistent within assay and within, but there's, you know, and, and again, you have dropouts because of the assay and you have dropouts because of the analysis pipeline that you're using. So you need to match both of those things to really be able to learn. Just out of interest, how long does it take assuming you know, no problems or once you press the button on your pipeline and your variants spat out the other end uh, on a cluster? So Matthew would be better for than me to answer that, but... Uh, uh, so... Data. So for general uh, exome, it's a question of um, hours or a day or so for exome sequencing because the, the size of the target will be uh, uh, lower. If we go for a world genome, uh, it's a question of day and day and week. For cancer, which is more complicated because we, the tools are more complicated, it's weeks, a few weeks to, uh, to run the, the full pipeline. But we could have some. We have some way when we were part of one uh, project where we analyze kind of general um, tumor in three days, but it's doing some trade just to focus on specific region. But, but in a case, yeah, it's usually weeks for what you know, one or three weeks. Uh, then you have to add uh, priority on the blood drop. The better is overdose. The blood drop cannot go into belly. Or 
but it, I mean, it is a limitation of the whole genome sequencing. So I think so. We're as Matthew mentioned, we're part of the pro a project where it's used in the con in the clinical context, and then waiting two weeks to get that answer is is an issue. So we actually have to you know sort of sort of trick the and use only a subset of the whole genome data to get an answer faster. Where we instead of mapping all the reads to the whole genome. We only map them to the exome, to the coding regions, which is where, or to a, even to a subset of actionable regions, such that we get, you know, a, an answer faster, and then we wait for the full answer two weeks later. But uh, I mean, the time it takes can be an issue with the whole genome sequencing for sure. And it's funny because you're generating all that data, and then anyway, you filter it down to the genes. So, you know, for some application, it makes sense to instead of mapping to the whole genome, which takes time, you map just to the genes. Thank you.